I'd like to invite Professor Wendy Jun uh, to begin the presentation. And Professor Wendy Jun is the professor at Renmin University of uh, China in the People's Republic of China. He also serves as the executive dean of the Institute of Advanced Studies for Sustainability. So Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I'm a kind of resource person to facilitate the rural reconstruction movements in China. Yes. And not only myself, we are a team. So that is the, the biggest peasants movement in mainland China, everywhere. So if you are international NGO or some overseas people, if you go to China, down to the uh, countryside, you may meet a lot of people, they are in name of rural reconstruction. Uh, we mobilize thousands of the students in 20 provinces, in 200 universities, to organize as a kind of student society, and then going down to the countryside, stay with rural people, help them to do the organizational renewal and the institutional renewal. Nowadays, we have a also mobilize a lot of citizens, try to merge to the peasants, and then to set up the, the agriculture safety, and then organic farming as a kind of system. So according to these needs, I mean the rural people needs and the citizens needs, the whole of the, the China now try to turn to a kind of a new age, that is ecological civilization. So my topic here is that eco-civilization and the rural revitalization. Few people understand what is the new century China transit, transit from where to where. Originally, China very much emphasized industrialization and urbanization. But since the 1997 East Asian financial turmoil, China facing the big challenge as the 1930s in Western countries that is overproduction, caused by the overseas demand large decreased. So the big industries cannot export too much. So the first round of overproduction happened in China is late 1990s. And from that time, there is a very serious discussion in the policy circle, how to deal with the overproduction. Originally, China is uh, similar as other developing countries were facing the challenge of shortage. Everything is short. But since the late 1990s, we have a new challenge, that is overproduction. Nowadays, we are facing the challenge of the second round overproduction. The second round means what? The industrial surplus and agriculture also surplus and financial surplus okay. So it's similar as the global crisis. So, caused by such kind of three surplus, means that China needs to transit. Now we transit to ecological civilization and the rural reconstruction. That means that there are a lot of industrial sub capacity and the financial capacity can move to the countryside. So nowadays, during this uh, 15 years construction, China, rural China, has been invite, invested by the, the urban industries and the urban finance at more than $2 trillion. Think about this big money. So you can see that when Western countries, they are facing the challenge of the overproduction, they may have their strategy. But in China, because it's a big rural area, now there's mo also more than 60% of the population live in the countryside. So they do, do need a lot of invest investments. So by 15 years, keep investment into the countryside. 98% of the village now set up five communication means that pavement road, electricity, and pipe water, and the gas, and the Wi-Fi. So means that small and mid-sized enterprises can set up in the countryside. That is a, a big change. So, but I don't know, because of the local media uh, have a very little uh, report. 
so the overseas know also know little about this big change. So let me give you my explanation. First, we need uh, to know the global crisis, not only happening in Western countries, also happening in China. The same. As, uh, as now I mentioned, that is uh, overproduction. And uh, we will know that China have a lot of new strategy. Since the, the beginning of the new century, China more emphasized the countryside construction. And then the cost by this uh, uh, diversity of the geographical situation. So uh, China invest into the local by different way. And uh, let's go down to the, uh, the basic situation. You may know that East Asian countries have different system as other Asian countries. We have uh, all of East Asian, including of China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam. These are uh, uh, so-called Confucianism. Historically, they have a equal distribution of the land to every household. That is history, it's a historical heritage, culturally, politically, economically. So you can see that when I circle these countries, means that in countryside, there's no landless, no homeless. Means that almost all the rural people, they are small landholders. They are petty bourgeoisie. <laughs> it means that we, have, we do have a low class, but low class, not extremely poor they all have at least the family has piece of land for the family survival. That is a basic situation. So up to now, if you go to do the research, especially comparative studies, you can find this in Japan, in Korea, in China, and Chinese Taiwan, and also Vietnam, there's no extremely poor. There is comparative poor, but not, not such uh, uh, poor as other developing countries. They may have a low ability to take the cash income, but at least the family can be survived. Okay, so that is a basic situation. So based on that, the village construction, especially the organization renewal, will be very important because scattered small household farmings can survive, but they cannot have a development. That is when we talk about the culture. What is culture? I said agriculture is culture. And ecological is also the culture because the nation, the nature is diversity. And the culture also diversity. Human beings culture must apply to the nature diversity. So that is uh, one, we do have large amount of the investments because the city, the, the, the industries all are facing the challenge of big surplus. So they need to transfer their investment, their capital, into the countryside. What kind of countryside applied such kind of capital investments? We need to make the people join the rural construction movements for the organizational renewal. That is our movement. And uh, let's go to uh, see something. So here, that's how to make the people have the organization, organizational renew, renewal, that is a big question. And uh, yeah, people much concerned of their, of their family life. But if you want them to have a kind of public construction, they need to have a kind of organization. So nowadays, we are very much emphasize the cooperatives. That is comprehensive cooperatives. But who can come to, who, who can go to help them to set their organi organization on we think that the young people. So we are a, 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 a group of the professors in this uh, so-called top 10 university. We are trying to organize the students, give them the training course, let them come to Beijing. And then we have a, somehow a team from these uh, top 10 universities famous professors, give them the 
the, the, the lectures. In local, they have no chance. But when we organize them, give them the chance to come to hear the lecture free, certainly that these uh, students can be the key persons in their local university to organize their, their uh, uh, classmates as a kind of student society, and then mobilize them going down to the countryside. What they can do? Performance with local. So it means that try to develop the local culture, develop the local performance, and then with the students' performance together. So that is why here you can see that a lot of people, they work for the <coughs> rural construct movement. Then help them to have a kind of the local cooperatives, means that they can strengthen their power by their organization as a cooperative. So we said it's a self-organization, self-empowerment, self-development, and self-management by the rural people. That is a kind of organizational culture. It's not just by individual. So that's different as uh, 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 before. So these are the performance by the local people and also by the citizens. We merge the citizens with the local people together. And then they may have a somehow is a mutual uh, 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 exchange. You may know that this very important phenomena in China is a new emerging uh, events. That is a big population became the middle class. And uh, you may not have the number. Let me tell you that how much. We have at least 300 million as a middle class. It's much bigger than the total population, middle class population in U US and Europe. 300 million middle class. Maybe increase to 500 million. It's um, two times than the total population in Indonesia. <laughs> anyway, it's the number. But means that the people do have the ability to do something. What the middle class needs from the countryside, agricultural safety. So if we mobilize these uh, citizens as a middle class to protect themselves and their family, they need organic products. So they need agricultural safety and how they have it help the local people. Because you cannot make any individual farmer because they have a very small land. You, if you want, want agricultural safety, you need to help them to organize as a kind of crop. So that is a exchange. So here to show that many citizens nowadays, they joined this movement. Even the movements in name of the rural reconstruction, but nowadays joined by a lot of people. So we said, we try to set up a kind of mass democratic platform. All people free entry, free retreat. So by such kind of movements, we can merge urban and uh, rural together. That is our work. We also organize a lot of self uh, uh, empowerment. We mobilize the migrants' laborers, organize their performance team, and then send them go down to the village. So help the village people. We also organize these retired uh, professional citizens going down to the countryside. So these are pictures shows that how that they work. Now, uh, we have a, every year we have a national conference, thousand people join, and uh, both from urban and from rural. They sit together and talk about how to strengthen our own power and how to gain our aim. So that is a rural reconstruct movement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wen, for a very enlightening presentation. We knew that uh, Chinese has millions of middle class, but we didn't know that it was 300 million uh, middle class in China and approaching 500 in the year 2021. So amazing improvement. And um, I would like to invite, of course, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Pak Nur Fauzi Rahman, PhD. 
Pak Nur Fauzi is currently the advisor and senior researcher at Sajogo Institute. And previously, he served as the special advisor to the chief of staff at the executive office of the president of the Republic of Indonesia. He is also a senior lecturer at the University of Pajajaran, teaching psychology for community. Pak Fauzi. Terima kasih. Thank you very much for the good introductions. What I will do now in 15 minutes is to try explaining an examples of how popular social movement may push a new policy at the national level. This is about the struggle for recognition, especially related to customary territory under the special scheme called Hutan Adat. Hutan means forest and Adat means customary. It's translated literally as a customary forest. Um, this is important. Okay. Um, of course, forest. The most beautiful and um, functioning forest mostly are in the customary territory. Why? Because they do not exploit. They protect the forest according to their customary law. Um, and we know th there are others uh, within the conservation territory yeah, under the management of the um, various uh, conservation scheme of the government of Republic of Indonesia. Um, within that customary forest, there are peoples who protect, care, and make the ecological function of the forest continue. Um, those people, most of them died already. They went into a luluhur <coughs> uh, spirit, a luluhur um, yeah, ancestor. And they uh, produce so many uh, surfaces um, to make these protections um, the forest uh, serve us with water and other biodiversity surfaces. And of course, they develop their relation with the forest. Uh, forest contains so many resources and they develop culture um, um, without any uh, visibility enough. But we know this is our um, richness everywhere. We can see yeah, in Indonesia. The problem is how we may get legal recognitions that may protect them from the extinction. Let me explain how I use these extinction terms. Uh, the term of extinction simply because um, there is a category yeah. and the categorizations of the customary forest into a state-owned forest. Yeah. Um, and then because this is a legal norm, it creates problems when the central government produce licenses for their corporations. Then if you have licenses as a paper, as a legal paper, then you have to, for example, you are the plantation companies or you are the forest companies um, to exploit uh, lots. Yeah, uh, then you have to create a control over your territory. Then you have to kick them out because, you know, they are disturbances. Well, the story that I want to tell is about the way those victimized peoples create a social movement 
and then articulate their aspirations to the national levels. In its terms, it's connected with the reform agendas of the state officials. Then it goes into a legal body, yeah. um, the uh, so-called masyarakat hukum adat, or officially translated by Aman into indigenous peoples, then they become a legal subject, and they have a customary territory. So here's the thing. When the customary territory or forest goes under the category of state forest, then it's an injustice categorization. Or we co uh, if I use the term from Charles Tilly, it's called categorical inequality, and which is durable. You know? If we will see the durable injustices or durable inequality, it starts with discriminatory categorizations. Um, for the masyarakat hukum adat or indigenous peoples, we may call that, in, or indigenous communities, uh, people also use customary based communities as a translation of the masyarakat hukum adat, they are in trouble. Um, when they resist against the um, state actions to deliver their territory into the corporations, then they are conducting protests. If the condition available, the protest will continue into resistance. So um, I learned political ecology of the forest territorializations. This is the step. Yeah, if you um, learn about the history, the step is it's colonial one. You know, it started in 1865 uh, when the colonial government set up the law on the uh, forest management in Java and Madura. Then it goes into the post-colonial uh, period when the Indonesian government absorbed the principle yeah, about the land um, is owned by the state. Yeah. And then they didn't respect to the uh, ownership status of the masyarakat hukum adat of their territory. Then the next step when the forest uh, were declared as a state property, then the go central government have an authority to deliver the concessions yeah, to the corporates or to the conservation agency or the other um, um, institutions. Then when the um, concessions um, exploit the resources, then it goes into the competing land claim with the local communities. If the local community is strong enough to articulate their protest, they will continue. Then here the story starts when in 2000, there is a new legal body, so-called constitutional court, was set up because of the amendment of the constitution. So this is the thing. Before 2000, we don't have a mechanism if there is something wrong in a legal or in undang-undang, in a national act. We, we, we cannot do anything yeah, except the legislative review to change the law. But after 2000, there is a, a, a court yeah, called Constitutional Court. The citizens who were victimized because of particular article or because of the whole substance of the law, they can bring the law or some articles of the law into the court to be tested whether the article or the law comply with the constitutional norm or not. This constitutionality will be judged by constitutional judge. Yeah. Then what was happened in 2012, the Aliansi Masyarakat dan Nusantara, national organizations uh, of the Indonesian indigenous communities or Masyarakat Hukum Adat, they submit 
a constitutional or judicial review to the constitutional court. Then um, the uh, Aman and other two indigenous communities won it. Yeah, 16th May 2013, the judge declared that this legal statement that categorized the customary territory as part of the state-owned forest is wrong constitutionally. So um, the implication is huge. Uh, because what then should be follow up by the central government? Yeah? Because you know many of the customary territories is already under a multiple large scale concession, whether it is corporate for production of the logs. Yeah? for production of the plantation, for the mining production, for the plain, um, palm oil, or conservation agency. Well, here's the thing. The masyarakat hukum adat or indigenous communities is continuing to struggle and push the government to continue. Even they proposed the national government yeah, to set up a national law on the protection of the indigenous communities and their right to their territory. This is the numbers of the Aman members in 2011. Um, Aman also worked at an international level, working with the um, new politics of indigeneity at the international level, uh, including work within the UN body, United Nations body, to produce United Nation Declaration on Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP. And they succeeded in 2007. They got it, and they used those norms to push Indonesian government to recognize their as the legal body, the right-bearing subject who own their own territory. Then, um, if we learn in detail about the constitutional court ruling, the, yeah, the ruling um, is important document to learn um, um, because there is a concept, an argument to challenge the previous norm yeah, that already embedded in the practice of the government officials yeah, and in the, you know, legal procedures under the um, laws in government regulations, in their habits, in their ways of doing to treat the masyarakat hukum adat in various ways. Well, I wrote in the newspapers, in Kompas, yeah, but this is the time, this is a new period of the perjuangan masyarakat adat to get the justice. So what then happened is um, the broken promises of the previous governments to, um, they have failed to bring the new law on the um, um, protection of the indigenous peoples, of the masyarakat adat. Then the responses, as we know, then is the popular responses with this, what I call as placizations, plangisasi, put plaques on their customary forest. This is the announcement. Hutan Adat, the customary forest of Padumo and Pituhuta in North Sumatra, no longer part of the state-owned forest. Yeah? Then these plangisations is not only one, it's Look at that, it's everywhere. Yeah? Um, then, after the government change, Jokowi um, Jeka set up a 
mission and vision statements, and they include the commitments to protect and do policy changes to recognize the customary territories and the rights of and other rights of the indigenous communities or the masyarakat hukum adat. Um, then later, when I was in the, um, the executive pre office of the president, I helped them to get um, the recognitions um, through the um, um, national uh, ceremony at the palace. Um, before that, the National Commission on Human Rights also conduct the national inquiry of indigenous peoples, um, rights within the forest territories. And they investigated 40 cases around Indonesia from the Sumatras into Papua. Yeah, and what kind of the human rights violations uh, happened uh, uh, on the ground. Um, this the the um, ceremonies. Yeah, uh, then it goes into another year, 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019. And you, you, you can see the statistics, yeah? the recognitions, the licenses that the government uh, produced. Then the new important um, um, ceremonies create a, what we call it in, in a legal terms as precedent, precedent. Um, I have one minute films. Please uh, open the film for us. It's only one minute. Um, it's about ceremony. <laughs> Dengan penetapan hutan adat, Kementerian Lingkungan Hidup dan Kehutanan Republik Indonesia mendorong masyarakat untuk mengelola hutan sebagai sumber kehidupan berdasarkan adat istiadat dan budaya setempat. Um, the last significant event it's not only about giving one unit to another unit to another unit to another unit in every year, but the government, under the influence of the important agencies of the indigenous activists, including one of them are here, the um, Badan Registrasi Wilayah Adat, they, they used the civil society um, initiative to participatorily map the customary territory. And the total areas that already mapped by these institutions is 12.5 million hectares of the customary territory. It's, then it's growing. Every year we can add more. And the minister of the um, environment and forestry ad ad adopt that numbers and details and then review it and for the first time the minister create a ministerial decisions to produce so called the indicative map of hutan adat and the total areas are 472 thousands more it's, it's, it's huge, yeah? And then, um, um, it's still, compared with uh, the new data from the BRWA, now it's already 14 million hectares of the total area. It's still smaller than, it's 10 percent, yeah? Uh, under 10 percent. But this is the start. We were dealing with the large scale of um, recognition that we need to help the masyarakat hukum adat and the customer-based community to develop their own culture in a safe way. 
Last but not least, this is the conclusions, yeah, um, one minute conclusions. Um, this is a case of popular policy making that made that was made possible by three factor. First is a particular way of visibility, yeah, including through maps. That that politic of visibility is so important in order to make the Indonesian governments, officials, expert, um, um, legislatures, the judge, know, aware, and recognize, respect the rights. We thought this, those visibilities is possible. The second one is a particular way um, of um, participation, yeah. particular way of representation. Those representation is impossible without the roles of the adult leaders yeah, into multi-levels side of struggle, contestation, and negotiations. The picture, the first picture that I show you is the picture of the Apai Janggut and other uh, you know, um, leaders from Sungai Utik in West Kalimantan. They got the Kalpataru. Yeah, this year they got also the equatorial prize. Yeah, one of the 20 communities, uh, more than 22 communities in New York, they got the award uh, uh, last week. So, um, the uh, feasibility, representations, and active engagement made the popular policy possible. And. This is one of the examples that I really urge you to learn because the customary territory is like the home of the traditional indigenous culture, knowledge, and practices. Thank you very much. Thank you, partner Fauzi Rahman. Uh, three main points that he made, adequate visibility, legitimate representation, and active engagement are three main features when we are thinking of popular policy making. And we, sincere, we sincerely hope that the next speaker would also enrich our knowledge on the issue. Um, the next one, we, we would like to welcome Mr. Rifal Ahmad from Gentra Law School. Pusat Studi Hukum dan Kebijakan Indonesia. Pak Rival, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, terima kasih. Um, um, my presentation is a, um, uh, quite simple uh, compared to the previous uh, presentation. Um, and um, my uh, the mass moderator encouraged me to you know speak in English because this is an international uh, forum. Thank you. And, um, but actually, um, I, have to, uh, I have to say that my point, my presentation, my point in my presentation is actually in, in, in language. So um, I have to, um, I, I have to, you know, um, uh, use uh, Indonesia as a uh, as a as a as a my my presentation because um, you know it's yeah I, I have to uh, uh, I have to practice my preach okay um, terima kasih jadi saya um, sejujurnya sebetulnya ini uh, excuse sekaligus saya juga mau membuktikan bahwa sebetulnya ketika kita ngomong participatory participatory culture atau ngomong soal uh, kebudayaan ini ada isu bahasa yang, yang yang paling penting bahasa dan bagaimana kita melihat bahasa dalam proses proses participatory. So I encourage uh, the English use uh, 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 participant to uh, take the one channel one, channel one or channel two or oh, channel, channel two, channel two. For our foreign guests, we would like to invite to use your uh, interpreting machine, and it's on channel two. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
Terima kasih atas atas channel one or channel two? Channel one. Sorry, it's channel one. Channel one. Professor Wen, you've got yep. yours. Thank you. Okay. Um, pendek saja uh, persentase saya, saya juga poinnya hanya 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 sedikit sebetulnya. Dibanding dengan kekayaan yang tadi, saya juga lebih, akan lebih bicara soal yang lebih abstrak, tapi akan membawa satu kasus, ya kasus-kasusnya adalah kasus yang paling penting bagaimana uh, proses partisipasi publik sudah dijalankan berdasarkan Undang-Undang Pemajuan Kebudayaan uh, uh, nomor 5 tahun 2017. Um, saya mulai dengan yang paling simpel, ada kalau kita ngomong soal, kita bicara soal uh, bring the people back in atau Bagaimana memperkuat posisi publik dalam pengambilan kebijakan, kita selalu bicara partisipasi. Uh, secara mainstream ada tipologi partisipasi yang paling umum, saya ambil yang paling paling apa, paling apa mudah saja. Uh, satu yang pasif, pasif participation, partisipasi pasif yang dianggap sebetulnya bukan partisipasi, ada partisipasi by consultation, partisipasi dengan uh, uh, mengundang kelompok-kelompok tertentu supaya bisa memberi input kepada pembuatan kebijakan, ada partisipasi dengan kolaborasi, beberapa kelompok sudah terlibat dalam tim dan kemudian mengambil kebijakan, dan yang terakhir yang yang kemudian disebut sebagai empowerment participation atau uh, empowering participation atau yang yang lebih melihat partisipasi bukan hanya dari uh, hasil yang dikeluarkan dari satu proses, tapi prosesnya itu sendiri adalah bagian dari proses pemberdayaan uh, publik. Um, ini yang paling sederhana aja supaya bisa bahas. Nah, yang yang jadi poin saya sebenarnya persis di sini gitu. Um, um, di sesi sebelumnya ada Ibu Bini Buhori yang sempat bicara tentang bagaimana proses pengambilan atau pembentukan kebijakan di Indonesia. Ada satu yang disebut sebagai teknokratik. Uh, kalau uh, bahasa saya sebenarnya percakapan teknokratik. Yang kedua ada percakapan akademik. Gitu. Yang ketiga ada percakapan politik, masing-masing punya ruang-ruangnya tersendiri dan seringkali sebetulnya tidak terhubung. Jadi um, yang yang juga dominan sebetulnya adalah ruang-ruang yang 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 akan pada akhirnya mendominasi dari isi dari partisipasi apa uh, uh, masukan-masukan publik itu. Nah yang terakhir sebetulnya yang jarang dibicarakan adalah yang disebut sebagai percakapan kreatif. Percakapan kreatif ini yang sebetulnya kalau dari kalau kita ngomong kebudayaan kemudian jadi satu jadi pembahasan yang menarik seperti tadi uh, presentasinya uh, Ibu Ellen Valencia, Bu uh, Bini, Bu uh, apa uh, pembicara satu yang dari India, Singapura. oh Singapura, uh, uh, Bang Oji dan juga Profesor Wang. Um, kita bicara soal yang disebut sebagai creative conversation gitu. Lima menit lagi, oke. Okay. Nah, um, oke. Okay. Kalau kita pakai kasus, sebetulnya saya mau ngelihat dulu uh, kita sudah punya apa di dalam proses pelibatan publik dalam pembentukan kebijakan di isu uh, pemajuan kebudayaan. Ada uh, Undang-Undang 5 uh, 2017 tentang pemajuan kebudayaan. Ada Perpres khusus tentang um, tata cara pembentukan pokok pikiran kebudayaan daerah sampai uh, pembentukan strategi nasional. Ini salah satu yang paling uh, menarik karena di isu di sektor lain sebetulnya nggak ada perpres yang spesifik tentang ini gitu. Jadi uh, Kementerian Kebudayaan, uh, Pendidikan dan Kebudayaan sebetulnya berhasil membentuk satu proses yang dengan sengaja, sadar sengaja melibatkan publik dari dari bawah. Nah prosesnya kira-kira gini. Secara umum ada 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 pembentukan pembentukan pokok pikiran kebudayaan daerah di level kabupaten dan kota, kemudian naik pembentukan pokok pikiran kebudayaan daerah di level provinsi, kemudian naik di tingkat nasional, dan kemu, an, uh, antar uh, uh, bikin master plan, yaitu sebenarnya antar uh, uh, lembaga dan kementerian di tingkat nasional uh, jadi master plan yang terakhir. Nah prosesnya kalau dilihat sebetulnya um, secara normatif maupun secara praktis oh, sorry, kebalik Sorry. Oke, okay. um, kalau dianalisis di sini ada Pak Inang yang sebetulnya mengikuti prosesnya dan menganalisis prosesnya juga terlibat dalamnya. 
secara umum prosesnya cukup partisipatif atau kalau kita bilang sebenarnya dia sudah sampai partisipasi uh, uh, by collaboration yang yang cukup terbatas karena sudah melibatkan banyak 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 kelompok gitu ya dalam dari bawah dari daerah jadi ada kelompok seniman kelompok akademisi kelompok publik yang umum ada kadang-kadang ada beberapa LSM um, uh, ada ahli ada tokoh komunitas dan segala macam um, prosesnya masih dilit sama government karena memang uh, pemerintah lokal yang harus menen, uh, membentuk tim uh, apa uh, pembentukan pokok pikiran kebudayaan daerahnya uh, multi stakeholder dialog jadi prosesnya ada pengumpulan data ada kemudian uh, pertemuan pertemuan di antara multi stakeholders yang kemudian menyepakati uh, melengkapi data dan kemudian mendiskusikannya um, juga sudah ada kombinasi antara teknokratik saintifik karena beberapa kelompok uh, kampus universitas se- salah satu yang yang menjadi anggota dalam kelompok itu uh, dan kemudian prosesnya juga ada proses politik karena ada proses analisis di level uh, provinsi yang kemudian ditetapkan menjadi uh, peraturan LK atau um, pergub ya perbub ya perbub per- per- tentang pokok pikiran uh, kebudayaan di level distrik dan sampai tingkat nasional di tingkat nasional uh, berbarengan dengan konferensi kebudayaan nasional 100 tahun ya 100 tahun uh, konferensi kemudian di, dibentuk juga tim untuk uh, menuliskan uh, men, ma, apa uh, membu, membentuk strategi nasional kebudayaan uh, Indonesia jadi kalau dilihat dari ini ini salah satu proses yang um, jauh lebih partisipatif dibandingkan pembentukan uh, uh, kebijakan di sektor yang lain ya. Nah, um, yang enggak ada cuman yang yang saya bilang sebagai non non uh, apa uh, creative conservation conservationnya. Ya. Karena sebetulnya kelompok-kelompok seniman yang ada gitu ya hadir datang dalam sebuah workshop yang sebetulnya didominasi oleh bahasa akademik kayak di sini gitu. Ya. Kalau di sini kalau seniman datang ke sini bahasanya akan cenderung di, di apa di, di, dimasukkan ke dalam satu bahasa bahasa akademik termasuk bahasa 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 kreatif yang lain nah itu yang sebetulnya jadi jadi diskusi menarik di di apa di Kementerian Kebudayaan sendiri dan di tempat di beberapa kelompok yang lain gitu ya yang pertama sebetulnya kalau kita mau melihat isu pertamanya bukan hanya pelibatan publiknya juga tapi bagaimana mengembangkan jadi beyond itu ya bukan hanya bukan hanya fokus sama kebijakan yang kita tuju bagi tapi bagaimana kemudian mem- mengembangkan yang disebut sebagai budaya partisipasinya sendiri karena kalau proses partisipasi tapi budaya partisipasinya enggak ada ya hasilnya sebetulnya bisa jadi dominasi satu kelompok yang lain atau ya ya tidak tidak sesuatu e, hal yang matang jadi yang pertama e, approach-nya harus ngomong soal empowerment Uh, uh, partisipatori uh, sebagai satu uh, pendekatan yang yang utama. Yang kedua, creating space for creative conversation itu yang uh, jadi membuka ruang sebanyak mungkin untuk bahasa-bahasa yang berbeda, bahasa musik, bahasa uh, bahasa seni, bahasa ritual, bahasa 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 teman-teman di disability misalnya bahasa isyarat itu yang yang lepas dari yang yang punya kekayaan dari sisi uh, uh, genre atau juga gaya bahasanya gitu. Um, di sini makanya sebetulnya kalau kalau mau mau dilihat ada interpreter ini salah satu bukti bahwa sebetulnya bahasa jadi luar biasa penting dalam proses percakapan gitu dan membantu kita untuk saling mengenali uh, inter apa intercultural uh, uh, lintas budaya. Nah yang berikutnya sebenarnya yang juga penting connecting formal informal formal non formal informal uh, lembaga gitu jadi uh, salah satu yang yang juga sebetulnya dianggap sebagai proses penting adalah bagaimana melihat kegiatan-kegiatan festival ritual adat uh, kegiatan-kegiatan politik adat kegiatan-kegiatan yang sebetulnya dilakukan selama ini sama sama kelompok-kelompok seni atau kelompok-kelompok uh, masyarakat secara genuin berkaitan sama kehidupannya sendiri bisa masuk dari proses proses pengambilan kebijakan jadi bukan bukan sesuatu yang hanya dikanalisasi oleh satu satu proses formal tapi bagaimana mendialogkan antara proses-proses di non formal dan proses-proses informal gitu uh, pengalaman saya misalnya di satu festival uh, masyarakat capung Indonesia misalnya pembicara pembicaraan antara kelompok-kelompok petani peneliti capung peneliti serangga perusahaan pestisida 
uh, uh, apa uh, konservasi apa uh, ahli uh, orang pegiat konservasi itu membicarakan bagaimana kemudian melihat satu apa uh, capung jadi pembicaraan tentang bagaimana mengolah tanah bagaimana kemudian me- me- meletakkan kebudayaan sebagai satu orientasi dalam uh, uh, apa uh, uh, strategi uh, konservasi di, di Indonesia um, yang terakhir sebetulnya supporting multi channel for exchange and uh, learning itu isunya adalah sebenarnya bagaimana melihat gimana memfasilitasi me- me- obrolan-obrolan percakapan-percakapan di tempat-tempat yang banyak ini gitu ya tantangannya sekaligus juga membuatnya jadi bisa bisa saling bertukar dan dan, dan belajar itu sebenarnya tantangan terutama gitu karena dalam pembentukan kebijakan kita cenderung lebih suka yang linier dan sederhana pokoknya hasilnya ada gitu outputnya ada kebijakannya gitu nah ini yang jadi jadi kritik nah ide praktisnya sebenarnya seperti ini yang yang sudah dibicarakan ya jadi ini bukan 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 hanya sesuatu yang sama sekali baru dari kepala saya tapi sesuatu yang sudah banyak dibicarakan gitu. recognize community rituals and festivals Um, jadi ritual-ritual komunitas dan ritual-ritual uh, festival yang dilakukan baik di kota maupun di, di desa itu punya punya rekognisi diakui sebagai satu model percakapan kreatif yang menghasilkan ide-ide baru. Jadi kalau buat teman-teman di seni dan segala macam itu sudah sudah jadi ide. Isunya adalah dia tidak direkognisi sebagai sesuatu yang bisa masuk sebagai dalam proses pembentukan kebijakan. Jadi kalau misalnya ada ada festival di mana gitu. nanti kalau ada pembentukan kebijakan biasanya diundanglah wakil dari sananya atau pemimpin komunitasnya untuk masuk dan kemudian diskusi hasil proses festival yang kemarin seolah-olah nggak pernah terjadi gitu nah ini sebenarnya yang, yang jadi tantangan yang kedua sebenarnya investasi di kolaboratif platform jadi kalau ini yang sudah dilakukan juga sama uh, Kementerian Pendidikan dan Kebudayaan misalnya ngembangin satu in- festival Indonesia Nak ya platform Indonesia Nak uh, uh, festival ada uh, pekan kebudayaan nasional yang sedang berjalan sekarang tapi juga bisa juga bisa berbasis sebenarnya berbasis teknologi gitu ya wiki model sebetulnya jadi satu cara github model satu apa baj, uh, ada satu tempat di mana bisa bisa mendiskusikan gagasan-gagasan lewat uh, tanpa tatap muka ada kalau di di beberapa tempat ada namanya platform kooperatisme salah satu yang dikembangkan juga di Cina di Kanada dan di beberapa tempat yang lain uh, yang selan, yang jadi tantangan selanjutnya sebenarnya yaitu tadi sempat saya bilang bagaimana interkoneksi antara forum-forum formal non formal sama informal gitu jadi apa yang dilakukan sama teman-teman koalisi seni Indonesia gitu apa yang dilakukan sama tadi um, yang Mas Gustaf kerjakan soal apa creative cities itu bisa jadi langsung punya punya percakapan dengan misalnya ke, ke, kegiatan-kegiatan di di dalam penyusunan kebijakannya langsung gitu yang ketiga sebetulnya aligning local policy agenda nah, ini ada satu isu kemarin refleksinya adalah universitas selama ini tidak terkait bahkan dalam pembicaraan pembicaraan ada wakil dari kampus gitu ada ahli biasanya tapi universitasnya sendiri sebetulnya atau apa lembaga-lembaga pendidikan dan penelitian kurang tersambung misalnya dengan kalau ada pokok agenda agenda strategi budaya di tingkat lokal misalnya jadi kalau misalnya ada pokok pikiran kebudayaan daerah di tingkat provinsi apa misalnya provinsi Jawa Barat apakah Universitas Pajajaran misalnya akan menyumbang uh, research-research yang terkait dengan itu gitu by design gitu bukan karena nggak sengaja bukan karena ada proyek uh, saja gitu tapi by design dikelola dengan cara itu yang terakhir sebenarnya ini uh, tantangan banyak pihak juga itu soal catalytic fund jadi kalau melihat dalam proses kebijakan sebenarnya yang paling kemudian jadi isu adalah bagaimana membiayai proses-proses inisiasi-inisiasi baru yang terkait dengan dengan itu gitu ya mengkoneksi satu sama lain gitu. e, mengakselerasi apa yang apa yang sudah kuat gitu nah ini yang yang perlu jadi jadi pertimbangan ke depan ketika kita ngomong e, bagaimana membuat publik rakyat atau kelompok-kelompok masyarakat bisa semakin semakin terlibat gitu karena isu terbesarnya adalah selama ini jangan-jangan forumnya itu hanya dikerangkeng oleh satu bahasa gitu bahasanya akademik atau bahasanya teknokratik gitu. Sedangkan bahasa kreatif selama ini ada di pinggiran atau termarginalisasi gitu. Jadi sama kayak di proses internasional ini sebetulnya bahasa-bahasa yang lain harusnya bisa difasilitasi atau mungkin bisa berdialog secara langsung gitu dalam dalam pengambilan keputusan maupun proses-proses belajarnya. Ada satu lagi isu yang menurut saya juga penting. Yes. 
uh, yeah, pembentukan kebijakan sebetulnya tidak langsung tidak hanya menunggu sampai di ujung sampai di tingkat nasional ya untuk dilakukan dan untuk di, di uh, untuk disepakati gitu tapi bisa juga sebetulnya uh, apa yang sudah disepakati di tingkat lokal langsung bisa dilaksanakan oleh komunitas maupun mungkin jadi prosesnya action reflection action sebetulnya nggak perlu menunggu sampai undang-undangnya jadi baru kita bekerja gitu tapi di banyak ruang dan banyak forum banyak layer sebetulnya bisa bisa sambil kerja di situ bu, di situ sebetulnya proses yang yang bisa jadi jenuin malah terjadi terima kasih thank you thank you Pak Rival um, I would like thank you very much one big round of applause Yes, for our amazing uh, presenters. And before we go on, I would like to invite all our participants to click on slide.do website. It's uh, located on the left and right side on the whiteboard where you could raise your questions digitally in the website where we will welcome uh, the questions and of course the, per the speakers here Uh, will answer one of your questions and um, could the organizing committee uh, scroll down in the list of questions because we see that there's nothing new in the list of questions mbaknya bisa di scroll down nih mbak yang slido nya karena kami nggak bisa lihat ada yang baru atau tidak All right, so we have three new questions from one person, Pak Gustav. Lihat-lihat ke belakang. So um, I think probably we could ask the speakers to answer one or two, but not three, ya, Pak Gustav, ya, because we need to also give time to other uh, participants. The first question is how to overcome policy and regulation complexity to recognize and protect indigenous land rights that located in the inter-administrative region in Indonesia. So the first question would have to be to either Pak Nur Fauzi or Pak Rival. Um, let's pick a question that could also be answered by Professor Wen. The first one I think is more to, to our Indonesian speakers. Second one is all right with you, Professor Wen. Eco civilization and urban revil revitalization. Yes, it's an intriguing term. How to make it work when the world is dominated by massive urban development and industrialization? This is a good answer. A, a good question for you. All right. Would you like to Would you like to start with the second question, Professor Wen? Thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, people know that the urbanization is a kind of a mainstream development. And uh, especially in Latin American countries and other uh, developing countries, when you do accelerate the urbanization, means that a lot of rural people will lose their land, lost their rights, and then they move to the city, but in slum. So there will be big disaster when you just uh, accelerate the urbanization by such way. So fortunately, unfortunately, in China, we still have a uh, 60% of the people living countryside. And especially when these are uh, 20 years, when China, 60%, 60, 60%, 60%, it means that we still have a lot of room for these uh, people maintain their rights including of the natural resources and also the physical properties. So when we are trying to m help them to have a self-organization, means that uh, they do have the room for their development. So, and, uh, so I think that urbanization is a kind of mainstream way for development, but it's an alternative way for the rural people is that you're trying to help them to use their own resources. And then, think about that. When we're facing the challenge globally, that's uh, overproduction and uh, the capital surplus. How to prevent your country from such kind of a global challenge? 
That means that to instruct this uh, financial capital to link with the natural resources means that the natural resources capitalization, the benefits, the interest taken by the local people. And then by such kind of way, you can enlarge the number of the physical properties. Nowadays, by such kind of alternative way, in China, we have in enlarged the physical properties to 600 trillion. This big number of the physical properties. And then based on that, we have more than 300 trillion financial assets. So the physical assets and then financial assets put together, in the end, you can think that the debts will be, I mean, percentage of the debts will be reduced less than 30%. Mm -hmm. So if you cannot create the big number of the physical properties, means that the debts will be a very big bubble and then created the crisis. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to find the alternative way to prevent this uh, biggest population country from the global crisis. That is the different way. So I said the culture, it's but it's advancement of the culture means that you need to join the global competition, but you need to protect your own rights. So that is uh, why I'm very much emphasize the alternative way for rural revitalization and then for the ecological civilization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wen. I would like to welcome uh, Pat Nor Fauci to address the first question by Pat Gustav. And you should blame Pat Gustav, Pat Nor Fauci. Thank you very much for the questions, Gustav. This is the very complex um, issues related with the policy, law, and regulations. How to um, let I use the term undo. Yeah, uh, the uh, legal categorizations. Um, one day I, I had a difficulties to use the term. If, if I am a printing person yeah, who work in a printing companies, uh, I had a printing companies yeah, in CIS Press. It's, it's not difficult to put errata or in Bahasa Indonesia, we call it ralat. Mm. Yeah, um, it just you know um, the um, okay. the corrections of the words that printed in the pages. Mm. It's easy to say that, but when it's about the article within the national law, then it's not only about the sentences or the word in the sentences. This is about the way of seeing and um, the bureaucratic practices that already embedded in the bureaucratic, technocratic thinking and practices. So for example, um, if you find um, the beautiful um, locations and then you are um, the conservation agencies um, then you may promote a place as a category of the state on forest um, within the conservation they have a scheme called Taman Wisata Alam yeah. TWA um, I just came from the Buyan Tamblingan um, Twin Lakes. In the, it is the 1,600 meter above sea levels, the highest lake in Pulau Bali. Um, tam, uh, Dana, yeah, Dana Buyan Tamblingan, yeah. And the Dana Buyan Tamblingan, it's around um, 1,600 of the customary territory under the management of four desa adat. Yeah, the, uh, and, and unfortunately, it, 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 the, the whole territory 
was part of the Taman Wisata Alam. So they're sac the, the sacred places, like, you know, um, um, the sacred place. Uh, yeah, a sacred place like, you know, temples and um, uh, water and the um, protected forest, the sacred forest. It's it then it goes become commodified, commodified. Mm -hmm. um, so how you can deal with that uh, complexity? Yeah. Um, then there is a procedure you have to intervene. Um, the the other case that I may uh, share with you is the Sungai Uti case. Yeah? Many of the Iban peoples, yeah, it's not only in Indonesia, they are in Sarawak. And how they deal with that? One day my son sleep in the uh, long house and he was exposed by the way that the Iban's families, they are, it's still in the um, Sarawak, and how they can visit the families. And easily, they show the tattoos as a passport. So when the Iban leaders plan to visit their families in Sarawak, they just go and show their tattoos. There's a specific tattoo they can show. Yeah. And, and it's like, the function is the same like the passport. Wow. So I don't believe the state mechanisms may codify that. No, that, that's a customary practices. And the state allow the space to maneuver, to them to maneuver. Um, if we bring it as a case into um, whether it's a question of whether it is legal, it is permissible or not, um, I don't think the, our legal uh, jurist expert may, may uh, help the case to answer. Um, so that um, will also help me to understand there is a mechanism for them to resolve the problem. Um, the legal recognitions also difficult because of the uh, administrative divisions. Yeah. Here are hierarchies like districts and then goes into the province. What happens when a particular ethnic communities that have a particular customary territories under two different districts? So the province should take over. Uh, they have to produce a particular regional regulations on the existence of the masyarakat hukum adat, of the customary based communities. Then in order to make district parliament or the provincial parliament to produce such district regulations or provincial regulations, that's a political move for them. It's difficult, you know. It's about languages. Who can understand the way the customary territories and customary peoples live? If there is no, somebody may help them to make them feasible and then legitimate to participate and engage in the policy processes. It's difficult for them. Yeah? Um, um, so it's still the problematic that um, I think the um, indigenous advocate may resolve that problem. Um, sometimes, I'm, this, is, this is the reflection, sometimes I think, do the bureaucracy may think or not? Yeah, because this is the question that people have. From the popular policy making examples that I show, they have a difficulties to do self-corrections. 
somebody and then it in it turns become social movements help them to do self correction or auto critic or then become something that may religiously called as bertobat terima kasih Thank you, Pak. Uh, there's one more question by the participant. May I know who is Ibu Rini Maulina? Hi, Ibu Rini. Boleh di-scroll down ke bawah, Pak, per daftar pertanyaannya yang di slido. Okay, Ibu Rini Maulina's question is about hutan adat. Hutan adat could be protected, but how about the safety of forests which are not under the protection of adat? customary law, especially from the development industry. So this is a question also either for Pak Nur Fauzi or Pak Rival. Perhaps Pak Rival? Pak Nur Fauzi? Yeah, for example, so yeah, I, I take an example of 3.5 million hectares of the palm oil plantations within the um, state forest uh, under the category of the conservation areas. Um, the proposed land laws is trying to how you call it to justify it to yeah in bahasa Indonesia terms is very simply called pemutihan that let them become and this is problematic for the for the policy processes because you know the the criminal act then they got uh, some benefits from, from that uh, forest. Um, then it's, it's like corruption in other ways. And then the new proposed land law will justify and or putihkan. Yeah. Um, of course, there is a national parks, yeah? Um, the, um, and other conservation agents uh, schemes. 27.2 million hectares of terrestrial and sea conservations. Um, that's huge. Yeah. Um, not all is the under the hutan adat. It's 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 bigger. It's conservation area in Indonesia is bigger, and that's one of the future of the Indonesian's ecological surfaces. Yeah. From the Aceh, from the Lusor into the. Uh, Papuans, uh, Ar Papua area, um, we have uh, so plenty of the national parks and other conservation schemes. Um, um, the um, challenge is there are uh, aggressions from the um, industrializations like the plantations, like the minings, like, you know, um, yeah, palm oils um, that uh, create uh, a monoculture or the extraction, yeah, the um, industry. It's very, very damaging for the uh, um, forest and um, their ecosystem surfaces. Arifal, do you have something to add? Okay, it's from Gustav, yeah. It's about the... Um, knowledge and language better in participatory, participatory policy making. I think that's my, that's my point. The, the issue is, I think, uh, first, the, uh, when we talk about the participation, it's always about the how to bureaucratization the process of policy making process with it engage the non-state non actors, right? So um, that's the issue. Uh, sometimes the, the, the engagement process is about how to you know, fill the foam, fill the the fill the borang, kalau bahasa ininya gitu. Fill the foam uh, and, and how to you know um, justify the uh, the the ideas that coming from this the the state and you know consult the people uh, apa, uh, the and the ideas. Then that's the, the one one of the issue. How to make this participatory policy making is not uh, isn't linear. It's a multi-facet uh, program or multi-inter-relation uh, uh, inter, inter from formal, non-formal, and uh, uh, informal uh, 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 process. That's the, the first 
one. And the second one is about the, the, the language. I think the language is about, you know, you, I, I am not an artist, but um, I think the, the, the language um, of the, uh, it's not about this local language, it's about the, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, or, or, or international language, or the bureaucratic language, but it's about how to, how to optimize, how to capitalize the diversity of our language in everyday life. That's because uh, our concern is about, uh, is about uh, how to genuinely um, uh, voices our uh, ideas. Um, and, and we can you know, um, just limit the, the forum or the, uh, the, the method to intercommunicate with you know, other, other language, other, yeah, uh, yeah, for these uh, visual arts people, it's about the visual, or for the um, drama or poet, it's like, um, one of the, one of the, one of my, my experience is uh, involved in, participate in poetry reading for policy making process in, um, in Sumba. Which is it's very very interesting because um, you know um, in Eastern Indonesia the language uh, the language is, is very diverse, right? So sometimes you can talk with the other uh, villages, people from other villages, because it's very different. Mm. But with uh, uh, poetry uh, poetry reading or man uh, mantra, mm -hmm. it's a mantra uh, um, um, reading. Uh, you, can, you can talk to other uh, communities, so that's the issue. The problem is for for the I think it's for for the uh, state apparatus or the 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 researcher because they, they 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 just you know they just want to reduce the very rich language to you know technocratic language or um, academic languages. So that's the the challenge I think. And how to you know uh, overcome the the barrier? Yeah, that's one of the one. That's one of the the state uh, or the Dirjen Kebudayaan roles. I think it's to support the innovation of the you know uh, the platform and exchange uh, learning action and other things. I think it's it's about the um, that's what my my issue is about participatory culture, not just. Apa, not just the participatory process, but participatory culture in, 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 in policy making process in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you, Parifal. Now, um, before we officially end the session, I would like to sum up the presentations made by the three amazing speakers. And the three of them departed from very different ideas. Professor Wen, of course, came uh, from People's Republic of China, where he underlined that there are 60% 60 60 of the overall population in China that still live in the rural area. This is very important for us all to know, because Indonesia is also a, a nation state that is, of course, based on agrarian uh, products. However, I don't think 60% of the whole population are still in rural areas. Whereas I think with the Chinese, they have made that the rural-based products um, very productive commodities to be exported uh, to abroad. And this is the thing that we also could learn uh, from China. But again, we are here also for the advancement of culture and indeed Pak Rifal, as well as Pak Nur Fauzi Rahman, have exemplary shown us um, for culture, particularly for Indonesians, it's not only about the ownership of welfare. It is far and beyond than that. And in fact, the Director General for Culture, Dr. Hilmar Farid, correctly underlining last night by saying that Indonesia bahagia 
Indonesia, the happiness of Indonesia. That is the main goal of Indonesians, the main goal of Indonesian culture, and it is embedded to all Indonesians. Why? Because it is written in our national anthem. Lagu kebangsaan Indonesia Raya memuat Indonesia bahagia. Mari kita mendoa Indonesia bahagia. That's the correct words. And with that, thank you very much. Can we have an amazing uh, round of applause? I see that the organizing committee has shown me um, a message. So before we end, when I serve as the moderator, Professor Wen, although I'm no longer a millennial, not unlike the participants who are quite young, I would like to do some uh, memento. And our memento is a souvenir, souvenir, selfie souvenir. Because we love selfies in Indonesia. I'm sure you heard about, about our, our selfie uh, custom. So let's do uh, selfie, Pak. So we, we take photo, Pak. Okay. With the participants, okay. yay. Okay, thank you very much, Sheshe, Professor Wen, Parifal. And we would like to invite Bapak Nur, Pak Agus Widiatmoko to deliver some souvenirs to the speakers, Professor Wen. Uh, perhaps we invite Bapak to take a photo with the speakers. Thank you very much. And the organizing committee would like to remind the participants as well as the speakers that we will hold the official dinner tonight at the Pekan Kebudayaan Nasional, National Culture Week in Istora. Uh, and the agenda is Makan Bajamba. It's a tradition from Padang, from West Sumatra at 6.30 in the evening. So 18.30 hours. And to participants and speakers are expected to gather in the north lobby of Fairmont Hotel, this hotel, at 17.45 hours, 5.45 p.m. And then the shuttle bus will leave at 6 p.m. So please gather at the north lobby of Fairmont Hotel, 5.45, if you would like to go to Istora for this official dinner. Thank you. And see you again.